Have you ever dreamed of starting your own podcast? Well, you can. It's simple, it's easy, and best of all, it's free. By going to anchor.fm, you can start your own podcast today and have your own show up and ready to go. Anchor's graphic user interface is user friendly and you get paid for your content by setting up a Stripe account. Go to anchor.fm. Again, that's anchor.fm and start your podcast today. Welcome to the Living Healthy Podcast, where you can improve your quality of life by making solid and informed decisions. I'm your host, Eddie Randall. Tonight, I have a fantastic podcast lined up for you. But first, please feel free to check out the latest merchandise at the Living Healthy Podcast Store. The link will be in the description of the podcast. Not all toothpastes are considered equal. There are some questionable chemicals that are used, and some of them can make you sick if taken in large amounts. That is why some tubes have the warning, do not swallow. Other chemicals are known toxins and can be potential carcinogens. Tonight's podcast is entitled, Do You Know What's in Your Toothpaste? A Look at Natural and Safe Options for Oral Care. Now, in addition to discussing toothpaste, I will also mention mouthwash, dental floss, and some other things involving oral care. Toothpaste. Toothpaste is one common thing that we can't do without. Everyone all around the world uses toothpaste. It's as common as the morning cup of coffee. Toothpaste is also big business, and the industry as a whole is worth about $19 billion. Toothpaste was invented by the ancient Egyptians around 5,000 years before Christ. They crushed and blended mint leaves, rock salt, pepper, and iris flowers. They combined this with water and made toothpaste. For toothbrushes, they use twigs with frayed ends. The closest thing that resembles the type of brush they use is the brush that's made to clean out the uh, dust in your car's interior air vents. I'll get into brushes later on as even the type of brush you use can make a difference. Toothpaste has evolved over the years into gels, whitening, sensitive, SLS, and fluoride free to name a few. It goes without saying how important it is to brush every day. You should brush at least two times a day and no more than four times a day. Brushing too much can damage the enamel and your gums. However, few people have that problem as some people's busy lives may only allow them to brush one time per day, but to each his own. You're supposed to floss at least one time per day. Toothpaste for the most part is healthy. It's safe for you to use, and it's very effective in limiting tooth decay and gum disease. That being said, it's important for you to know what is in your toothpaste. There are certain chemicals and additives that can become very problematic. Saliva is where this all starts, as saliva not only breaks down food in preparation for for digestion, it also absorbs things into the body. This is how powerful saliva is. When you walk by someone who's eating a freshly cooked meal and it smells great, even though you're not hungry, your saliva kicks up production in preparation for eating and breaking down the food. Even though you're not getting ready to eat, it's just amazing how the body works. Think of it this way. You see movies or shows where a person has chest pain and they take nitroglycerin, which is a sublingual medication. When you place it under the tongue, Saliva goes to work dissolving it and it heads straight to the bloodstream. Another example is at the end of World War II. Many Germans bit down on cyanide pills and the poison that was released in the mouth was absorbed by the saliva and headed straight to the bloodstream. I'm merely using these two examples to show how things end up in your body through your saliva. Chemicals can help you as well as harm you. That being said, your toothpaste is generally safe. The thing is, when it comes to questionable chemicals that are in your toothpaste, 
It's a good idea to pay attention to what's in there in hopes to do your best to limit your exposure or flat out avoid them. So what is toothpaste made out of? Toothpaste, much like mainstream products, have a general mainstream formula, but they differ in a way that allows their formula to be patented, allowing that manufacturer's particular toothpaste to be unique. Typical ingredients include abrasives, such as calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate, and silica hydrate. These abrasives are used to help remove food that cling to teeth and gums. Sorbitol is another ingredient. It is a humectant whose job is to keep the toothpaste creamy by retaining water. In order to build up that foam and get the paste in between the teeth and all around, foaming agents or surfactants are used. Some common surfactants are cocomotopropyl betaine, sodium lauryl sacrocyanate, and sodium lauryl sulfate. Fluoride is used to help fight cavities and to provide protection to teeth. Toothpaste also needs to taste good, otherwise people would not buy it. So aroma is put in to give it a good taste. Aroma is a common term for a chemical compound that gives the toothpaste the desired taste based on the marketed name of the product. When people think of toothpaste, most think of a mint flavor. Mint on its own would be bitter, so toothpaste is sweetened to give a desired taste. Sweeteners like saccharin and sorbitol are often used. Toothpaste also has to have a particular look. Aside from the health benefits of toothpaste, the look is more on the side of marketing. Certain chemical compounds like titanium dioxide are often used to obtain a desired color. Toothpaste can go bad, so in order to prevent that from happening, preservatives are used. Such preservatives include methylparaben, potassium sorbate, and sodium benzoate. In regard to preservation, a binder must be used. A binder simply keeps the toothpaste together to prevent the paste from separating back into its dry chemical and liquid components. Binders include carbomers, carrageenan, ethyl cellulose, and sodium carboxam. Aqua, or water, is used as a solvent. Aqua's job is or water's job is to allow the compound to mix so it can be used. When all the ingredients are combined, the pH has to be taken into effect, as this can affect the taste, quality, texture, etc. pH measurements are taken and compounds are used to help regulate the pH. When a person has sensitive gums or a bad tooth, a sensitive toothpaste is often recommended. The toothpaste is often milder to not cause irritation. In addition, chemicals like potassium citrate and potassium nitrate are used to help replace the eroded enamel. Now, these are some of the average, normal, routine ingredients that are used in toothpaste. And they're very effective and they do work. That being said, there are some questionable ingredients that are used in toothpaste. Now, what are the questionable ingredients and what is the concern? The rise in health conscious individuals looking for healthier alternatives to the mainstream has become commonplace. This has spilled over to the demand for increased accountability from manufacturers. Manufacturers have stepped up due to consumers and in regard to federal regulations. That being said, there are some ingredients that you should be mindful of when choosing a toothpaste. The first questionable ingredient is one everyone knows about, fluoride. For years, the number one thing we all hear about fluoride is that it's great for our teeth and gum health. It's even put into our water systems. I'll get into that into in another podcast. The thing is, fluoride does help to strengthen teeth, but only a very small amount of this is needed. According to the CDC, Fluoride content of toothpaste sold in the United States is limited to 1,000 to 1,500 parts per million. That being said, too much fluoride can lead to dental fluorosis. Now, this is a condition where too much fluoride can cause the teeth of children to become yellow. Fluoride is extremely electro electronegative. It'll pull off hydrogens and essentially attack the enamel that is forming on the teeth. 
This can happen when children accidentally swallow toothpaste that contains fluoride, or even when children use a toothpaste that contains fluoride. During the younger years, from birth until eight or so, the enamel on your teeth is starting to develop. Fluoride attacks the enamel, removing the protective film, which can lead to tooth decay, cavities, and worse. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration requires manufacturers to have a warning on products that contain fluoride as to keep them out of the reach of children, or in regard to toothpaste, to supervise your child while he or she is brushing. If you look at some labels, they will say use a pea-sized amount on your brush, or if you swallow more than what you should normally brush with to contact poison control. By listing these instructions, it is the manufacturer's hope to limit the amount of fluoride that you're ingesting. Another ingredient is called SLS, or sodium lauryl sulfate. It has many other names, such as sulfuric acid, ammonium lauryl sulfate, and sodium laureth sulfite. It's used in toothpaste, soap, mouthwash, lotion, facial cleaners, and detergents to give a lathering effect. It's a low-cost surfactant, so many manufacturers use it. It's so potent that it can be used to degrease car engines. It's also used in fruit drinks. In this regard, it's used to help combine fruit juice with water. And as with many controversial chemicals, when we compare what is allowed in the U.S. to what's allowed in Europe, the use of SLS in drinks is banned. What SLS can do is that it can break down the enamel on your teeth. It can cause canker sores, it can cause skin and eye irritation, and even cancer. So what manufacturers have done in order to make it safer and less harsh on skin is to create SLES, which is sodium laureth sulfite. To do this, they take ethyl oxide, which is a known carcinogen, and they make SLES. However, the SLES can become contaminated with the byproducts of ethyloxation, called 1,4-dioxane. So you run the risk of ingesting a carcinogen every time you brush your teeth if your toothpaste contains SLS. Keep in mind, SLES is another name for SLS. Propylene glycol is another ingredient. It's used more or less as a preservative. It has other names. Some of them are dihydroxypropane and methyl ethyl glycol. It's used in a plethora of foods to maintain shelf life. Foods like soda, marshmallows, and salad dressing, to name a few. It can also be used in some medications. It's used in pet food, except in cat food. The United States has recognized it as not being safe for cats to consume. Additionally, it's an additive in clothing, as you can use it to make polyester. When it's put in toothpaste, the goal is to help retain the paste's moisture and texture. The concern is that this chemical can be an issue for people who have kidney disease and or liver disease. The CDC recognizes it as being safe, but they do also state that it could be a skin irritant. Excessive levels are known to cause neurological issues, kidney disease, heart attack, and liver disease. The FDA states that a safe amount to ingest is 23 milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day. In Europe, it's used in limited products. Seeing that it is used in so many products in the United States, we're actually exposed to more than the FDA's daily recommended amount. In addition, since it can cause so many issues, you can limit your exposure to this chemical by picking a toothpaste that does not have it. I wanted to take a moment to say thank you for supporting the podcast. The Living Healthy Podcast is listed on many platforms, including Anchor, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Bullhorn, and many others. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. And don't forget to check out the Living Healthy Podcast channel on YouTube. Also, if you have any questions or would like me to discuss a particular topic or you'd like to be a guest on the show, please contact me 
at livinghealthylivinghealthy at gmail.com. Carrageenan is another controversial ingredient. It has no nutritional value, but has been used in foods like ice cream as a thickening agent. Manufacturers soon applied this property to toothpaste to aid in form and consistency. What carrageenan does is it allows a product to remain creamy and consistent during packaging, shipping, and while it waits on the shelf in your local store until it's bought. In the European Union, carrageenan is used in certain foods and in toothpaste, but is forbidden for use in infant formula and organic food. In the United States, it's permitted in infant formula, as well as a plethora of foods, personal care items, and cosmetics. The National Organic Standards Board advises the USDA, and despite the USDA saying carrageenan is okay, the National Organic Standards Board fought to have it removed from being listed as an organic ingredient in organic foods. This was back in 2016. As far as toothpaste, the good thing is that there are toothpastes that you can get that are carrageenan free. Carrageenan is derived from seaweed, but that doesn't mean that it's innocuous. The unfortunate thing is that in the United States, it is deemed okay for carrageenan to not always be listed on the ingredients label. Carrageenan has been linked to a plethora of issues, including insulin resistance, liver cancer, widespread inflammation in the body, colon polyps, colorectal cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, and allergies. There is an article by Bahachara, Pfefferman, and Tabachman called Distinct Effects of Carrageenan and High Fat Consumption on the Mechanisms of Insulin Resistance in Non-Obese and Obese Models of Type 2 Diabetes. They conducted a study of mice fed a diet containing low amounts of carrageenan. They discovered that the mice developed inflammation due to carrageenan and became insulin resistant only after six days. Our microbiota is important as it sets us up for life, pending any genetic abnormality that will affect our immune system. Our microbiota is what aids in determining how healthy we'll be as we fight off pathogens without getting sick or we recover from a prominent illness such as COVID-19 infection. Exposure to the right amount will allow carrageenan to throw off our gut microbiota. There's an article by Chesang, Van Duval, De Tot, and others called Dietary Emulsifiers Directly Alter Human Microbiota, Composition and Gene Expression Ex Vivo Potentiating Intestinal Inflammation. They use an M-shime, which is a simulator of the human intestinal system complete with microbiota minus a live human. They discovered that carrageenan can promote inflammation, causing an imbalance in our stomach's microbiota. The main premise is this. Carrageenan versus polygenin. Carrageenan is recognized as being safe although results in lab testing show that it promotes inflammation and is a potential carcinogen. Polygenin, which is a known carcinogen, is a byproduct when carrageenan is broken down. This happens under an acidic environment, hence the acidic environment in our stomach. However, there is some evidence that states that the stomach does not have the environment that can promote formation of polygenin. That being said, Polygenin occurs naturally in carrageenan before it's even broken down. Hence, the inflammation that it causes. Did you know that when testing a medication, like an anti-inflammatory drug, they first use carrageenan to induce inflammation to see how well the drug will react to it? We are surrounded by carrageenan due to the amounts of products that it's used in. In particular, if you eat a great deal of processed foods, you expose yourself even more. Continued exposure can eventually lead to colitis and other bowel diseases. There is another article written by Bernard, Coltrone, Mitchell, and others called Degraded Carrageenan Causing Colitis in Rats Induces TNF Secretion and ICAM-1 Upregulation in Monocytes Through NF-KB Activation. 
They studied degraded carrageenan in rats and determined that the rats developed mucosal ulceration and colitis. Diethanolamine, or DEA, is known as a foaming agent and an emulsifier. It is an eye and skin irritant and it's also suspected of being an endocrine disruptor and has been linked to kidney as well as liver cancer. The European Union has limited DEA in personal care products to only 1% in the preservation of health and longevity. In Canada, it's flat out banned in cosmetics. DEA can react with other ingredients to form deadly carcinogens called nitrodiethylamine. There is an article on the National Library of Medicine's website called Determining the Endocrine Disruption Potential of Industrial Chemicals Using an Integrative Approach, Public Databases, In Vitro Exposure, and Modeling Receptor Interactions. The article is by Alof, Kasanga, Inyat Hussein, and others. They analyze data on in vitro testing of DEA using the human uterine Isakawa cell line which is essentially a cell line presenting estrogen and progesterone receptors. It was determined that DEA disrupted the signals of the genes responsible for expressing estrogen in the body. Environmentalworkinggroup.org lists DEA as a carcinogen, an endocrine disruptor, and a skin and respiratory irritant. Artificial sweeteners are also used in toothpaste and the goal is to make toothpaste taste good so that consumers will buy it. And rightfully so, as no one wants to use an ill-tasting product. However, just like cod liver oil or castor oil, the benefits should outweigh the bad taste. That being said, aspartame is one of the common artificial sweeteners used in some toothpaste. If you remember seeing a sugar-free soda that contains aspartame, it would say phenylketonurix, contains phenylalanine. This is in regard to PKU, a genetic disorder that people develop from their parents, and people with fetal ketonuria cannot break down phenylalanine, and it will build up in the body and cause brain damage. In regard to toothpaste that contains aspartame, the human body breaks it down into wood alcohol and formaldehyde. Both are toxic to the body, both are carcinogens. Aspartame can possibly also lead to heart palpitations, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, cancer, and Parkinson's disease. There's an article on the Biomed Central website by Landrigan and Strafe. It was published in April of 2021. The article is entitled Aspartame and Cancer, New Evidence for Causation. They reevaluated evidence from the Ramazzini Institute back in 2006 that stated that aspartame causes cancer. They use immunohistochemical analysis checking protein markers and found that aspartame did in fact cause tumor growth in mice and rats even at levels close to the daily recommended intake approved by the FDA. There are some toothpastes that have no sweetener. And if you cannot find one without a sweetener, try to get one that uses Zytol. Although it's an artificial sweetener, as of right now, the only thing that has been reported in regard to Zytol is that concentrated amounts of it can cause diarrhea. I left silica for the last, as it's not really a dangerous chemical. Silica is a mild abrasive that is mainly used to help to get teeth clean. These small particles work to scrub plaque and debris off of our teeth. The downside is repeated use can lead to enamel erosion and tooth sensitivity. This is especially true if you're consistently using whitening toothpaste. It's pretty much in every toothpaste, but whitening toothpaste has a higher content and it will be much more harsh on your teeth. Alternatives and Safer Options Everyone wants the best for themselves, and the best thing is to select toothpaste options that do not have the toxins I just mentioned. Granted, they will tend to be a bit more, but the cost of the toothpaste over decades of buying them will pale in comparison to the impact to your health and the financial burden you will face from medical bills. When I first learned about what's in toothpaste, I felt confident in making better choices on buying a better paste 
to limit my family's exposure and my exposure to potential carcinogens and toxic chemicals. Then my attention fell to the toothbrush I was using. With bleached white bristles and a multitude of plastic dyed in beautiful colors to attract buyers, I thought about what goes into making toothbrushes. Toothbrushes. Now, they've come a long way. As I mentioned earlier, ancient Egyptians used twigs with frayed ends. In ancient China, they used bamboo with the hair from the back of a hog's neck. Today, we have plastic toothbrushes with nylon bristles. The plastic handles that we use are made of phthalates, PVC, and BPA. The bristles are made from a variation of nylon material. As far as the handles, there is only so much you can do. You have to use something to brush with. Plastic is necessary because it is cheap to make and it does the job of holding the bristles. More importantly, plastic does not provide a sufficient environment for bacteria to grow. Although a toothbrush can harbor bacteria and viruses, it's unlikely to do so. All you have to do is simply rinse off your toothbrush thoroughly and shake it dry before putting it back in the toothbrush holder. One of the main topics today is climate change and protecting the environment. Most bristles are biodegradable, but the toothbrush handle itself is not. Fortunately, there are safer options for your teeth and for the environment. There are BPA-free toothbrushes, bamboo handle brushes, charcoal-infused bristles, and a plethora of variations. They even have some boar bristle bamboo handle toothbrushes that are 100% biodegradable. Given these options, you can get whatever suits you. I recommend getting a BPA-free brush and try not to bite into the back of the head of the brush while brushing and try not to use very hot water when rinsing the brush. Using lukewarm water to rinse after brushing will be sufficient to disinfect germs. In addition, change your toothbrush at the recommended three-month period or a little sooner. That being said, our gums are paper thin, and using hard brushes regularly or brushing very hard will destroy your enamel and your gums, resulting in periodontal disease. Check with your dentist, but I recommend brushing gently with a soft brush at least two times a day, three times max. Flossing. Part of oral care involves flossing. Flossing is great, and doing it regularly drastically improves oral health. Common floss is made of nylon, polyester, Teflon, and even silk. Some are also made of PFAS, polyfluoral alkyl substances, which are linked to a plethora of disorders in the human body. On Harvard's website, they state that dental floss can contain dangerous chemicals like PFAS that can lead to liver damage and cancer. Last year, I did a podcast on the dangers of PFAS. I'll put a link to that episode in the description of this podcast if you would like to check it out. A key thing is that floss has to be easy to use or people won't buy it. Hence, the wax that it's coated with as it needs to glide between teeth to remove food and bacteria. However, that convenience can come at a price. There are natural and safer alternatives out there. As an example, Tom's has an anti-plaque flat floss that's out there and it's a safer alternative. Um, as a side note, I'm not being paid by Tom's to mention them. Um, that's just the floss that I researched and I found that it is a decent one to use and I personally use that. Mouthwash. Just like some toothpaste, mouthwash can contain artificial sweeteners and chemicals that can expose your body to certain chemicals. And just like toothpaste, there are safer options out there. These options offer sweetener-free, pH-balanced, alcohol-free, fluoride-free, and SLS-free. Those options may be a bit pricier, but as I always state, the benefit outweighs the risk. That's going to do it for Episode 11 of Season 2 of the Living Healthy Podcast. As always, thank you very much for your continued support. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time. And remember, living healthy creates a better you.